Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. Burials in limbo at St. Catherine Cemetery. Psychiatric community reacts to findings in Capri's report. And later in sports, the West Indies struggling against South Africa on opening day of first test in St. Lucia. I'm Anthony Lugg. Here are the details. We begin this afternoon with a developing story. There are long delays for burials at the Medores Memorial Gardens in St. Catherine as several workers have come off the job. TVJ News understands the issue surrounds a wage dispute. We attempted to get a comment from a representative from Medores a short while ago. We will refer, defer this until later. We have a pressing matter we're going to address now. And I, I assure you, you will get a full sum report in short order. But this industrial matter will be addressed and you will also get an exclusive going forward. A St. James-based pastor who was accused of raping a 15-year-old girl at his home in March has been charged. The 39-year-old clergyman was charged yesterday after being interviewed by investigators from the Center for the Investigation of Sexual Offenses and Child Abuse. He is charged with rape and is scheduled to appear before the St. James Parish Court on June 14. The teenager told the police that the pastor raped her when she visited his home. The matter was reported to the police on May 28. To a TVJ News follow-up now, more details are emerging following yesterday's helicopter crash in Hill Run, St. Catherine. The aircraft belongs to the Jamaica Defense Force. General Oppressius has this TVJ News follow-up. A dramatic Wednesday in Hill Run, St. Catherine. No, I didn't see it when it come down, you know. I just came and see it. Like the tail up in the air, the white part of the tail of the copter up in the air. So I don't really see when it come down. Describe what you're seeing around here, like, like people injured, they're trying to rescue no, anybody? Sir. No, no, I didn't see anybody. We see a white helicopter land and it lift up, go back down the rolling side, then it come back this side, then we will look at explosion. The usually quiet farming community swarmed by members of the Jamaica Defense Force after a helicopter made an emergency landing. Less than 24 hours after the incident, a statement from the JDF. It said the aircraft was being flown by a student pilot who had to perform a precautionary landing. The pilot, the statement adds, was taken to a park camp where a full evaluation was done. According to the JDF, he is stable with no apparent physical injuries. He's also being given the appropriate medical support. As for the aircraft, the JDF says the initial investigation shows no significant damage. The JDF also also maintains that it continues to exercise best practices in aviation and will be conducting the appropriate safety investigation to determine the cause and remedies to prevent a recurrence. Janela Precious, TVJ News. As violence continues to grip Central Kingston, head of the Central Kingston Police Division has revealed that migrating criminals have been carrying out some of the attacks. Superintendent Maldria Jones-Williams was speaking earlier today. The Kingston Central Police have had their hands full over the last few weeks due to several gun attacks and reprisals across the division. Communities known by names such as Southside, Tel Aviv and Spoilers are just some of them. Superintendent Maldria Jones-Williams is head of the division. We have 32 gangs in the space, 15 active out of that 32 at present. Um, we also find that the gang activity it does is not centered only in Kingston Central. We have gangs who are affiliated to gangs in St. Catherine North, St. Catherine South, Kingston East, Kingston West, even as far as St. James. The police have increased their presence in the area, but the residents say more is needed to help bring an end to the bloodletting. PNP caretaker Imani Duncan Price has intensified her cause for a zones of special operations to be declared in the division. We're free, and the grand pit of them free and charm at that. We need justice down here, so. Several arrests have been made in relation to shootings and murders in the division, but a trend is emerging. To carry out their activities, they normally um, use or solicit the help of these um, affiliates 
outside of the division to carry out their gang activity. That aside, Superintendent Jones Williams says the team remains committed to address the problem in central Kingston. She is, however, renewing the call for residents to continue assisting the police by providing information. Trust, as you said before, is, has always been an issue. It's an inner city community and the residents don't trust easily. Um, that's a fact. And they, 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 they don't give up information that readily. But and we're going to maintain our presence in the space for as long as it takes to ensure that the residents remain safe. The psychiatric community has been reacting to the latest report from the Caribbean Policy Research Institute, CAPRI, on devastating findings on mental illness in children. Shamela Pullen had been speaking with former president of the Jamaica Psychiatric Association, Dr. Earl Wright, and joins us live. Shamela? Thank you, Anthony. Well, none of the findings in the CAPRI report came as a surprise to Dr. Wright, who told me that it is not the first time issues relating to mental health have been highlighted. He's only hoping that this time there will be decisive action to address the problems. The latest report from the Caribbean Police Research Institute, CAPRI, on child mental health has the psychiatric community talking. Among the shocking findings, only 8% of children with mental health needs in Jamaica are being met. Former president of the Jamaica Psychiatric Association and consultant psychiatrist Dr. Earl Wright says this paints an accurate picture of what exists on the ground. You will see a child and the, the, the resources and the numbers that are there and not there that you can see the child and in another week, two weeks or sometimes in another couple of months. So we're talking about numbers. If we don't get the appropriate numbers of the various categories of staff, then we'll always be coming back with this problem. Dr. Wright says it's not the first time CAPRA revealed similar findings. But despite several programs put in place to address mental illness in children, not much priority is given to this area. Dr. Wright is hoping the report is not going to be another nine-day wonder. He thinks the government should take the lead and address the issues outlined once and for all. I'm sure if you go to the Ministry of Health, there will be a number of programs that are written up. But what has happened is that there is always an emergency that pushes mental health to the back. And then you don't get the programs being implemented. We also have to look at the whole resource, how it's allocated and do something about that. As it relates to shortage of child psychiatrists, as pointed out by Capri in the report, Dr. Wright says to study in this field is a long-term investment that takes years. He says this area of study is never funded, which is a big part of the problem. Until we have a stream of fellowships going into the child psychiatry program where an individual, like the other specialties, can be got, get a scholarship or a fellowship to become child psychiatrists. And they know that when they graduate, that as a child psychiatrist, they will be paid appropriately. Then that's not going to happen. If you don't have that sort of fellowship, then individuals are not going to invest. Despite the shortcomings, Dr. Wright says local psychiatrists in the private and public sector have been trying to see as many children as possible. Shamela Pullen, TVJ News. It's time for a break. Stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back. Continuing the news. To have summer school or not, that debate continues to rage as the 2020-2021 school year comes to a close in a matter of weeks. Stakeholders in the education sector were guests on TVJ's All Angles last night. Sandy Williams has our report. 120,000 students have not participated in any form of learning since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020. That data from the Ministry of Education. But there is a suggestion that the numbers could be more. Mandatory summer classes is being proposed to alleviate the learning loss. Florida Plummer is a past principal of the Nagahead Primary School. I do believe 
believe that this summer should be used for catching up. And when I say that, I'm not talking about the, the summer school that we normally have with the students having to pay. What I'm talking about is um, summer school run by the government, to put it that way, not the summer school that we, we, we are accustomed to, where the students have to pay. They should use the summer school as a means of catching up. But whether government funded or not, some stakeholders in the education sector have opposing views. One area of concern is the teaching learning modality as teachers continue to lament the challenges of online learning. The fact is that some of them, most of them, they had data or they had Wi-Fi access, but the connection is so bad that they kept keep getting in and out of class. And that created such an issue for me because it's not easy when you're doing a concept which is new and then the students keep dropping off, coming back on. Teacher, I didn't hear you. Can you repeat this? Miss, I'm trying to. And it's, it's, that has been my personal issue, not hearing, getting kicked off, not seeing the work that is uploaded. President of the Association of Principals of Secondary Schools, Linvern Wright, argues that summer school could be used to address learning loss, but it would not be effective if it will be done via online platforms. Therefore, he believes more dialogue is needed before considering that route. Is it that we're going to be looking at some students and say, okay, these are the ones we're going to bring those in? Those are some of the questions that I think we need to answer before we have a really useful discussion on this summer school program. Are you, is this your very diplomatic way of saying you have no idea what the ministry is doing and they're not telling you? Because that's what it sounds like. Well, 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 <laughs> it, it is. We have not had consultations on this any at all. And, and, and I really believe that if it is that you are going to do it, you know, no, no, I, I am not sure if it has happened with others, but I know from my association we have had no dialogue regarding, okay, how this is going to work. The Jamaica Teachers Association remains adamant that it is not in favor of its members engaging in classes during the summer break. In early May, more than 500 schools had resumed face-to-face -face classes, but only for students preparing for exit exams. Sandy Williams, TVJ News. And we have an update to our top story. Now, all burials at the Medarest Memorial Gardens in St. Catherine have been postponed for today. This as workers are taking protest action over a wage dispute. We will have more on this developing story in subsequent newscast. The Cornwall Regional Hospital in St. James is reporting a reduction in the number of healthcare workers who have called in sick since the COVID-19 pandemic. Clinical coordinator at the hospital, Dr. Delroy Frey, thinks the COVID vaccine has a lot to do with the current situation. Shamela Pullen reports. The pandemic is not yet over, but already brighter days are ahead. Clinical coordinator at the Cornwall Regional Hospital in St. James, Dr. Delroy Frey, says since the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine, quite a number of doctors and nurses have taken the jab. Well, let's look at the data. Before vaccine, we usually have like a check with matron this morning, like 20 nurses off on quarantine. This morning, after vaccine, uh, vaccination, this morning we have like two nurses off. And I think that is significant, although small data that, 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 that tells that, you know, the vaccination is doing something. Now, Dr. Frey is calling on Jamaicans who are skeptical to take the vaccine to do so. He's reminding citizens that the vaccine does not only minimize hospitalization, but prevents people from becoming critically ill if they get COVID-19. Taking the vaccine gives protection. The question is how long it will give the protection. No one knows that yet. And I think we'd have to wait a year down the road to see how that happens. But taking the vaccine will minimize hospitalization. It will minimize you going into a critical aspect of COVID um, crisis. And I believe it's absolutely necessary that we should endeavor to ensure that the vaccine is given and patients take the vaccine to minimize or to stop this pandemic. And while the COVID situation is under control to some extent, Dr. Frey says crime should be that way too. In recent times, 
there have been a number of shootings and murders in the St. James area. Dr. Frey is calling on the persons involved to stop as it can be quite costly to the hospital. If we were to treat these patients are an unnecessary injuries if these were taken out of the system. And as I've said before, one of these patients can take you five, six hours in operating theater and the recovery time they can spend weeks on the ward in ICU. And if you were to cost something like that, that's, that's an enormous cost that could have been prevented. Shamela Pullen, TVJ News. 20 new cases of the COVID-19 virus were confirmed on Wednesday from 657 tests. The country's overall case count is now 49,110. The country's COVID-19 positivity rate now stands at 2.9%. One new death has also been recorded, pushing the death toll to 989. In the meantime, 156 persons are hospitalized with respiratory illness. Nine are critically ill. There are 20,733 active cases. Mayor of Port Maria, Richard Crary, says the parish's 53 disaster shelters are fully prepared and ready for the 2021 hurricane season, including the 46, the 43 designated isolation areas for COVID-19 management. We have all our shelters have been expect, uh, inspected in 2020. Um, we have identified isolation areas in the majority of them. We have also disabled friendly shelters identified. Um, ADPEM has provided us with a number of items requested for the use in the shelters. A number of those items have already been distributed to shelters. Mayor Crary adds that each division within the parish has been given has been allocated $700,000 for drain cleaning activities as part of efforts to prevent flooding. As of Wednesday, St. Mary recorded 1,595 COVID-19 cases. Mr. Crary says the Municipal Corporation has already made contact with a community health aid worker to render assistance in case of a disaster. ...that are right across the parish, they would be better equipped to assist us in the shelters in, in, in the event of a disaster. So those discussions are, are ongoing as to exactly how the logistics of all of that would be worked out. And for the latest in business, we go to Cody and Barrett. In the business world, another manufacturing and distribution company has announced that it will try to keep price hikes at a minimum. Lasco Manufacturing says it will be transitioning to solar power as a long-term effort to keep prices low. However, for immediate relief to consumers, the company has adjusted some of its production processes and operations. Despite stationery and office supplies' recent expansion, it announced it will no longer be producing notebooks until further notice. The move comes following losses in sales due to the switch from traditional to virtual learning. The company will instead focus on producing more supplies for the corporate market. Founder and Group Chief Executive Officer of Access Financial Services Group, Marcus James, has been appointed Executive Chairman of the entity. Other changes in the company's leadership include the appointment of Frederick Williams, who served as Chief Operating Officer and General Manager of the Jamaican Division, to Group CEO. CEO of Proven Management Christopher Williams stepped down as Chairman, but remains a shareholder appointed Director of the company. And that's it for the business. News Minute, I'm Cody Ann Barrett. And we head to a quick break, but Renata Brown is standing by for sports. We'll be right back. Welcome back. It's now time for Midday Sports. I'm Renata Brown. Now at Sportsland, the West Indies were in trouble at 74 for 8 on day one of their first test against South Africa at the Darren Sammy Cricket Ground in St. Lucia. After winning the toss and batting, the Caribbean side reached a lunch at 48 for four. Craig Brathwaite, 15, Shea Hope, 15, and Kruma Bonnet, 10, and Kyle Mears, 1, were the wickets to fall before lunch. German Blackwood, 1, Ralston Chase, 8, Joshua De Silva for a duck, and Rakeem Cornwell, 13, are the wickets to go since. The Windows have made three changes to the team, which drew against Sri Lanka in their last game. 
with a debutant Jaden Seals, Rostin Chase, and Shea Hope coming in. in these pandemic times. Nine UK-based players have been named in Jamaica's 12-member squad for the Intercontinental Playoffs for the Olympic Games in Monaco. The Crocs will be led by Captain Conan Osborne alongside Omaria Cato, Tyler Bush, Daniel Fessel, Rontree Adamson, Mason Caton Brown, Anthony Bingham, Ashley Smith, Michael St. Clair, O'Shane Eddy, Orlando Macedo, and Fabian Turner. The 12 team men's qualifier will see only the winner advancing to the Olympic Games. In football, uh, after a long layoff, the reggae girls will return to action later this afternoon when they face Nigeria in a friendly international in Houston starting at 4.30 Jamaica time. And this will be the first game for the Jamaicans in more than a year as their last fixture came against St. Kitts and Nevis on February 4, 2020. A win for the 51 ranked reggae girls will mark their first victory over an African nation. Jorginho Wijnaldum has signed a three-year deal with Paris Saint-Germain after leaving Liverpool on a free transfer. The Netherlands midfielder opted against signing a new contract at Anfield and moves to the French capital after being linked with Barcelona. PSG are understood to have made a better offer than Barca, with manager Mauricio Pochettino's presence also thought to have been a factor in Wijnaldum's decision. News and Athletics now as Olympic champion Omar McLeod will compete in the men's 110-meter hurdles at the Florence Diamond League meet in Rome this afternoon. McLeod will be looking to better his 13.08 second season's best time. He's joined by the second fastest American this year, Devin Allen, as well as Francis Pascal Martino Lagarde. That race runs off at 1.55 Jamaica time. At 1.42, Megan Tapper will compete in the women's 100-meter hurdles. Point guard Chris Paul scored 17 points and set an NBA playoff record as he helped the Phoenix Suns to a 123-98 victory over the Denver Nuggets. Paul became the first player to rack up three playoff games with 15 assists and no, no turnovers as the win gave the Suns a 2-0 lead in the best of seven Western Conference semifinal series. Devin Booker scored a team-best 18 points for the Suns who have, who have now won five consecutive postseason games. And game three will be played in Denver on Friday. And finally, Russian 31st seed Anastasia Pavlenchenkova continued her late bloom by reaching a first Grand Slam final with a victory over Slovenia's Tamara Zidancek in the French Open last four. Pavlenchenkova was a dominant junior player but had never previously reached a Grand Slam semifinal against another debutant. At this stage, she won 7-5, 6-3, on the Paris clay. And that's it for your midday sports. I'm Renardo Brown. It's back to you, Anthony. All right. Thank you, Renardo. So, Renardo, should we start pulling out the brooms this evening after Kevin Durant wins game three? I, I would say that. The Brooklyn Nets looking fantastic with, with KD. I, I would think so. I but think so. What too. about Paul George? I think so too. All right. <laughs> and that's the midday news. I'm Anthony Lugg. Join us at 7 for Primetime News. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.